My name is Michael Whitaker. I'm a committer on the Apache Crunch project. Um, and I think most companies start the big data journey in a similar way. And so depending on whether you, you know, have been doing it for a number of years or whether or not you're thinking about getting into playing with some of the big data tools, you probably started with a small group of engineers and tasked them with a problem. Now, the problem could, might not even have known about big data or be related to it. You know, it might be, hey, we want to add this functionality to our solution. We want to extend something onto our three-tiered architecture or, you know, offer this new back-end service. And this team probably starts trying to figure out how can we do that? How can we write this to scale, to build up this functionality, to actually sit on top of an architecture that could possibly work for not only this problem, but future ones that we want to kind of tackle and accomplish. And so if the teams start researching, you know, they'll look, what can I do on the back-end database? You know, maybe I'll start reading papers, and, you know, they'll probably start looking at the gateway drug of big data, which, you know, is Hadoop, you know. They'll start writing MapReduce. They do the prerequisite word count to learn how to do that, and then, you know, try, start trying to solve the problem or scale it out to something else. You know, and they'll say, okay, MapReduce is good. We probably can do some stuff with that, but maybe we can do something a little better. Let's look at something like Hive, and now we can write SQL statements that compile to MapReduce, and I'm no longer writing as much Java code, I'm more writing SQL. Or maybe that doesn't fit it, and you want to do some scripting through something like Pig. Um, and so you're still kind of at the meat of it doing MapReduce processing, but you now kind of add a new little flavor on top. And, those, and so they're saying, OK, great. Now let's start the next step. Like, maybe we have to be able to serve the data up, and so we need something that's scalable beyond a normal database. So you start flirting with the NoSQL H-based scenario. Um, you know, and there's other ones out there, depending on what you're used to. And then you're like, OK, so we now have the processing. We now know how to store it. Um, maybe we have to do some orchestration. So they kind of ease into the next little drug, which is Uzi, you know, which lets you go and build steps together to have a nice workflow of all of your processing. Um, and you know, as you're kind of building through this set of tools, the team in itself is basically having to become experts in each of them. You know, they're learning the ins and outs. When is it right to use a Hive query versus writing a custom MapReduce job? Or at what point does Pig out of the box do what I want, or do I have to drop down to write UDFs for it? Um, you know, how do I structure my data in HBase? And more than likely, if it's a small group of team kind of doing a prototype or a one-off, they're also wearing like the ops hat, so they're knowing how to change memory settings for each of these various things, how to tune their queries, how to basically run the system and not die. Um, and you know, that team's building up that expertise. And they're knowing how to apply the technologies in the various ways. They're essentially becoming experts. Um, and hopefully, if everything goes well, the end of the story is that this team becomes successful at doing that. That product is successful. It, you know, you know, they're viewed as success. You know, it gets rolled out. Customers are happy. But once you kind of see that initial success, then what normally happens um, is you start coming up with more problems. And more problems and more opportunities for you to start trying to solve things beyond what that small little team can handle. You know, you have this group of tight-knit individuals who know what's going on, but you know, you now have all these new business opportunities to try and tackle. How do you actually scale out to be able to do that? And this is actually something that happened at our company. You know, we started with a small search type application, went up to a more real-time alerting system, then to a cloud-based system, and then finally we're, you know, starting to try and do things across many different silos of data, aggregating them together into a single place. And so that the problem basically moved from no longer trying to build a scalable architecture, something that engineers are constantly battling with, but it's a problem we know how to tackle, but more we had to scale that knowledge. How do we get that team of experts to be able to expand their knowledge um, out to a wide group of people without causing a brain drain on the original problem, or without having the same lag time it took for that team to become experts, having to pay that cost again and again with each new solution as you bring on more and more developers. Um, and we, you know, we had that growth problem. And it wasn't more a matter of just like, hey, it's this next step, is it here, it's another small project, or things like that. You know, kind of over, our company over the last couple of years has done things where it's OK, first project was a small group of 10 engineers, next one was about 30 or 40, then the next project was 100 engineers just for that, and then 100 more. And so it's, not like that one guy can sit there answering questions for all of them. You have to be able to scale up the development very easily. Um, and of course, when you're deciding whether or not to do big data um, or all these different problems, you have to make sure that 
using a big data technology is appropriate for what you're trying to solve. You know, the major criteria of whether or not you should use big data are the three Vs, volume, variance, and velocity, how fast the data comes in, how, what's the size of the data, and how widely diverse it is. And for better or worse, as we've kind of tackled new solutions, most of the time we've already, we're always tackling, and these are all applicable to our solutions. Um, and so, you know, some of the solutions we're dealing with, you know, we have daily, weekly, and monthly uploads of stuff all the way from small megabytes up to gigabyte files. So we have that um, variance and volume in there. Um, sometimes we have 60 different file formats just being uploaded that we're going to have to be able to process. Um, we have constant streams for some of the alerting systems, you know, getting uploaded and piped through, and we have to be able to process or aggregate them down to make them processable. Um, and then, you know, out of those different streams, you know, we're, we're getting about two terabytes, um, and this is probably out of date based off of some of the newer solutions that have been rolled out. So we constantly have this kind of diverse problem of um, scaling up our engineering effort, but also being able to tackle processing this amount of data. Um, and so we started looking, um, out of one of the solutions we were looking at, um, it was kind of do you, you know, we had data in various locations, how can you build a complete record of this person across various systems? And we were, you know, getting data in various formats. We're getting Avro data, CSVs. Some of the data is getting ripped out of other third-party systems like Vertica. Um, some of it might be stored internally um, in our HBase system. And then we have to kind of take it through a few processing steps. And then when the yeah, final output of that is we need to store it in HBase, um, maybe put it in Solar or Lucene Index to be able to query it, to be able to serve it up, and then also, you know, handle some of the analytics of something like Vertica. So we kind of had this many different types of inputs coming in, a lot of data going through the system, and then also displaying it in a variety of use cases and functionality. Now, looking at this diagram, it's very high level. You obviously aren't implementing anything like this. You know, you're composing lots of systems together. Um, and this might be an example of kind of one of those problems. Um, just if we zoomed in to actually just kind of that normalizing block at the very beginning, you know, this might be a set of processing steps we want to take this data through. So we take in two different types of CSV files. One of them is the reference metadata about what we're going to process. We take in the raw CSV file, which is the data we're actually processing. We kind of group it together to understand what it is actually, you know, and filter out stuff that's invalid or doesn't meet a criteria, and then kind of group it together to build this whole record about the person, and then finally output it. Um, and th like this is even um, a trivial example of what the amount of work that they have to do to actually even normalize the data. But if we look at that type of processing and we look at the normal map reduce model, you kind of see there's a bit of a problem. It's not easy to fit those steps into this, um, this set of um, map, shuffle, sort, reduce without having a decent amount of skill set. Now, those experienced people in the room who say, I know map reduce. I can look at that example project, I look at MapReduce, I can you know, break it down to two jobs, write custom driver code, and boom, be done by lunch and looking at Pinterest to figure out what I want to cook for dinner and not think about, any, you know, think about it that much. But if you were to give an engineer who's gone through the simple word count problem this first diagram and told them, make these boxes with joins and groups, group by keys and, all, and multiple inputs as opposed to homogeneous inputs, and tell them to fit it into this box, it's going to take them a while. Or they're going to be Googling, finding up custom implementations, and be like, oh, I can use this guy's join implementation. Let me copy it into my code here, and let me take this over here. And you end up with a lot of duplicate code or code that people maybe don't understand, or possibly a fragile system. So we wanted to try and figure out how to make it so that developers could scale up easily on big data processing using um, one of the various systems available. And so we wanted to overcome the struggle to fitting in a MapReduce. We wanted to be able to integrate at the correct processing step instead of at the persistence level. With Map and Reduce, um, a normal MapReduce job, you kind of get the data comes in, the data comes out, and there's the only places you can integrate. It's a black box in the middle. But if you wanted to suddenly start branching off of one of the processing steps that was maybe inside that black box, you know, you better become buddies with the people who own that. Um, or have to copy a lot of code around. Um, custom implementations of common patterns. As I mentioned, you know, things like joins are not 
normally natively available in MapReduce. You can find umpteen blog posts on here's a join algorithm here, here's a join algorithm here, and if you, keep, if you don't kind of have a nice solid foundation, more than likely your company's gonna end up with four different joins and that's a lot of debugging and annoying things for the same type of functionality. Um, and then of course the biggest one is evolving requirements. Um, while an expert can look at that first problem and be like, I know how to fit it into MapReduce, um, being able to handle the next thing out of the box is not simple. I kind of use the analogy hearkening back to you know, childhood where everything was a road trip in the family car. You know, my dad would be packing the car, the cooler's there, all the suitcases are there, and then me and my sister and my mom would come up and be like, here's more junk, try to fit it in. Um, while you might have had it nicely spaced out, you suddenly have to unpack the car and re try to fit everything into it. And you know, that simple pipeline, we now suddenly want to be branching off of, and we want to anonymize the data to send it off to our data scientists who don't have access to view the um, raw things or something like that. Or um, we want to, even though we filtered out some data, we actually want to um, keep all of the raw data around for debugging purposes or bulk loading into another system. You know, this suddenly drastically changes whatever design I had for fitting this into a simple map or reduce job. And you know, unfortunately, requirements keep changing and evolving at all time, um, and having a fragile system to start with is not a great way to build a good foundation. So with that in mind, and knowing we had to scale up development, knowing that we had to be able to tackle new problems as they came up, new opportunities even, um, not just problems, um, for development or building out new solutions, we kind of started looking around what else was available in the big data space. We had, um, we had to come up with a way to do easy integration between teams. If MapReduce jobs only do persistence at the edges, you kind of have gentleman handshakes to say, hey, I'm gonna write Avro files, here's the schema, I promise not to change it on you. Um, you know, and it's in this path. We could do a little better than that. You know, we could make, try and make sure that, hey, it's actually the right type of data, um, and let us break down that integration, or to make something that we can um, build off of solidly. Um, we wanted to focus on the processing steps, because when a lot of these endeavors kicked off, we didn't know what the entire step or the chain of events of what the data was gonna necessarily look like immediately to what um, types of filtering or manipulation we needed in the middle, so we wanted to focus on being able to easily drop those in when appropriate. We needed a shallow learning curve to be able to scale up for the number of developers who are suddenly gonna be MapReduce experts or doing MapReduce work. Um, and the other key thing was we wanted to be able to tune for performance. So how do I tweak this to make it run better um, without kind of giving away all, all of that functionality and assuming that the thing will do it correctly for me. And so we looked around and there's a number of options out there. There's things like cascading. There's ways with Hive and Pig you could maybe do a lot of this processing. Um, but the one we kind of landed on was Apache Crunch. Um, and the goal of Apache Crunch is you compose things into a processing pipeline, so it's explicitly there to take the data and send it through various transformations. Um, it's kind of the open source implementation of Flume Java, so um, an ex-Googler, an ambitious young individual, inspired and frustrated with some things, kind of set out to write this project. Um, so it's got a little bit of, um, it's got some legs behind it with various companies using it, um, and it's got at least a solid foundation of Google's had been successful with it, so um, other people can as well. The thing, key thing is that it's, it focuses on the transformations of the data as individual steps inside that process, not the overall transformations that might be inside of a single MapReduce job. So it's a lot smaller components for you to branch or to move off of. And one of the nice things is that it hides um, the serialization or the baggage that maybe comes with some MapReduce. So if you're used to MapReduce, everything is a writable, you know, you, have, you don't deal with Java strings, you deal with the text class, and from the text class you can get to the string or you can transform it back to bytes. But if we could write our code just dealing with Java POJOs or native Java um, objects, and not have to worry about how the thing gets written out to disk or when it gets serialized for a convenience or anything like that, you know, we can hide a lot of that complexity from our developers and they just have to focus on the transformation. And so, <clears throat> going back to this example problem, if we start trying to apply the concepts that are inside Apache Crunch to this problem, the first thing we do is we see that this set of steps of taking in, having a starting point and an end point, 
we have what's known as a processing pipeline, or in Crunch's terms, a pipeline. Um, and that's basically, the pipeline is basically a programmatic description of the DAG. So where's my data, what's the transformations, and how am I going to end this diagram, or this directed acyclic graph? Um, pipelines support the concept of lazy execution, and this is a good thing, um, where if you're starting to describe how your processing wants to occur, you want to be able to describe it completely before you ship it off, a off to a cluster to actually do the work. So you sit there describing the um, processing that's going to happen, and then you ship it off to do the work, and um, it computes how to do things efficiently. Um, the implement there are three implementations of pipeline, depending upon what your use case is. Um, we primarily are using MapReduce. We're excited to start looking at the Spark implementation. It's just a different runtime under the covers. Um, and then there's a memory one that's really there for more of testing or very small data volumes. And the nice thing is that your processing logic is completely hidden from which implementation it's running on. You simply um, pick the pipeline implementation at the start, um, and then from there start building the processing steps off of it. So your developers are spending their time building the DAG, but someone gives them the pipeline at the beginning, and then it's off and running on whichever platform you want. And so if you're used to MapReduce, um, the first line is what you'd probably be using. You give it the driver class so it can figure out which class loader to load inside of Hadoop um, and which jar to ship to the cluster. And then you give it the configuration object. So here's my HDFS cluster with MapReduce and my job tracker or my Yarn resource manager. Go start running and being awesome. But <clears throat> once we have a pipeline, we still don't have anything necessarily to do. We have to say, let's take this data, let's do something with it. And your um, DAG or directed acyclic graph has to have a starting point. So with that, the first starting point is a source. Um, basically, it's, there's various source implementations out there to, for you to choose depending upon what you're um, trying to implement or where you're trying to retrieve the data from. You have to have at least one. And that makes sense because a directed acyclic graph has to have at least a starting point. Um, and so you have to have one, at least one per pipeline. Um, and it basically is responsible for reading up or will be responsible for describing how to read up the data for you to actually do your transformation and your processing on. Um, you can write custom implementations. They aren't that complicated. We've done a few um, when we wanted to read data out of Vertica or read data um, out of a different file system, things like that. So you can do custom implementations if you have your data stored in a proprietary format. And there's a lot of custom, or sorry, there's a lot of the standard ones already available, sequence files, Avro, HBase, there's a JDBC one, um, text, CSV was contributed as well. And what you get once you're reading out of, a, out of the source is you aren't getting the raw bytes to interact with. What you're getting are strings, Avro records, POJOs, stuff that you would be commonly are normally coding against in Java and not having to worry about, hey, this was read off of out of HBase, so that means I got a byte array, and now I have to transform it into the results object, and then from the results object, I have to pull more byte arrays out to actually get it into uh, real objects that I want. You know, it's, it cuts out some of those steps for you. And so you're dealing with first class Java members. And so code wise, um, super complicated line. You say pipeline.read from a text file and at the, the path. Now there's a little bit of API sugar, I guess, behind the scenes. Um, what it's doing is it's saying, I want to create a new text file source, read from this path with this p-type. And you're probably going, well, what's a p-type? Um, <clears throat> p-types are, um, so somewhere earlier in your code, if you were using this line, you probably said, hey, this is a p-type of string. What this means is that from the text file source, I'm going to be reading values, and they must be of type string. And so a p-type's goal is to hide the serialization from you, you know, give you the Java native forms that you're used to writing you know, normally. You know. um, and if you wanted to, you could start composing complex types, so pairs and tuples, or even pairs of pairs and tuples of tuples of tuples of tuples. Um, or if you want to, you can also do um, some more complex um, data types, so if you have you know, schemas to describe things in Avro or Thrift or protocol buffers, you can you know, tell it how to read the data out. Um, there are some other bits to the p-types. Um, one of the differences between Crunch and some of the other libraries is that Crunch supports multiple serializ serialization types, which means under the, behind the scenes, 
depending on which p-type you choose, it'll say, okay, when I'm serializing this thing out to disk, I'm going to be using Avro to do that, or I'm going to be using the writable library, depending upon what you want. And that serialization type is just called a p-type family. Um, for most new beginners getting into Crunch, you would just use one of the two default ones, but if you wanted to, you could write your own. Um, and, but you can also easily convert between the two if you have to, for some reason, like I'm doing all this processing and the final output has to go to something that only accepts writables, you could do that if you wanted. And so creating p-types is usually pretty simple. So I want a p-type of integers, I want a p-type of strings. Um, so I'm using average.strings or writables.ints to get those respectively. And then if I wanted to use something kind of like a first class or higher order object, um, you know, I have a schema somewhere describing the person class, so I say avro.records, and it'll create that for me. And so if we go back, um, and then as I mentioned, you can do even more complicated ones. So this is a p-type of a pair of a string to person, which is in a sense a key value thing. So they, there's even another one called a p-table type, which, you know, for key and value um, together a little bit more explicit version of a pair in that sense. And so if I go back to the, um, if I go back to the code, I'm now reading from the text file source and saying that the p type is going to produce a type string and it gives me back what's called a p collection. Now the nice thing is um, using the p types and then knowing the value of a p collection, I'm now getting compiler time warnings if my types are never gonna match up. So one of the things you maybe, if you're used to MapReduce, you know, you described your key input, your key output, your, um, and things like that, and you don't find out that you misaligned them until runtime. Crunch will at least give you that heads up that you're, you know, not getting the right type back that you expect if you, for some reason, um, try to do this. So what is a P collection? Because that was one of those concepts I just introduced. And a P collection is basically an immutable, unsorted list, or unsorted distributed collection um, that represents the potential data that you might be encountering. So if you remember, a pipeline is lazily executed, so while you'll have a p collection variable that you might be tempted to start iterating over immediately, it doesn't actually hold all of the values anywhere. You know, it's, it's intended to represent some step inside of the transformation. You can start iterating on it. The unfortunate thing at that point is once you do that, all of the data that you possibly are looking at is gonna be sent over the network to your one port little machine, which means you aren't taking advantage of any of the value of a distributed computing cluster like MapReduce. So only do that if you actually really want to. Um, and the key thing is with a P collection is that you can't really just say, here's a new P collection. You can, re you can read one out of a source and then you can transform it into other versions. You can't just kind of will one into existence. Um, and that kind of plays into the concept of the DAG as far as you know, reading in the data, processing it, and writing it out at the end. So if we look back at our diagram, at this point we've got two sources, we've read in the data, um, we have two different P collections because we've read from two different file systems, um, and now we kind of need to start processing it. So we want to take the CSV, we want to make, turn it into an, um, an object because Nobody really wants to have to write the parsing code again and again and again and reuse it everywhere. So what we want is P collection of strings, get it out of P collection of reference data. And so what we do is in that magical little box in the middle is we implement something that's called a dofn. It's a fairly simple API to implement. Um, it's a lot of where your business and custom logic is going to reside. So you'll write probably many of these um, to handle your type of project. Um, and it basically, this function gets applied to every member of that P collection once those have been realized on the cluster, and they'll process those elements one at a time. And once you're processing those elements, you can be doing whatever business logic you want, um, and then you have a choice basically for the normal dofn, you could choose to omit zero or many items for it. There's actually specialized forms to kind of cut down on some of the boilerplate. You can do a map fn, which says for every one item in, I'm guaranteed to be returning one value. Um, or there's ones like filter fn, which says, decide whether or not to include this guy. And so you just have to return a Boolean. So there's variations to make your life a little easier as a developer. But for actually implementing it, like if you're gonna do the raw one, you essentially define it as this. Of, I'm gonna extend the dofn class, then there's Java generics that say, here's a string, um, and here's the string which is gonna be my type of data in, and the ref data is gonna be my type of data out. And there's one method you have to implement called process, 
which basically says, you know, take in your string, and here's an emitter for all the values you're going to emit based off of that one value. You know, so um, I gloss over the parsing and things like that. So I take in one string, I parse it, and then I emit one value. And so essentially, that's as much code as I need to do to actually transform it. And I now actually have a nice little function that I could be writing J units for, um, testing just that parsing logic as it exists right there, and not have to try and run the entire pipeline to find out, or the entire um, MapReduce job to find out I had a bug in my parsing. Um, to actually apply that function that I just wrote, so I had the ref strings was the values I read in from the source. I then, on the ref strings, apply the function um, fn. And I say that I'm going to, when I apply that function, I'm going to be generating um, data of type ref data. And this will do all the type checking, making sure I'm aligning, making sure I'm not messing anything up. It'll make sure that I'm not putting in a function that doesn't do the right transformation for me. Um, and then, of course, since I'm reading in two different types of data, I have a different one that does the same um, parsing, but actually on the raw data, and I get that guy back. So now I've kind of moved farther down the pipeline and got those boxes solved. But now I need to join the data. And this looks a little weird, because I don't have a common key. And I basically essentially need what's known as a p-table. Because um, how do I join two bits of data if they don't have a common key to do that on? And so a p-table, um, quickly, is just a and it's a variation on a P collection. So it's a P collection of pairs of keys and values. So um, nothing too mystical about it. Um, but it's a multi-map of key and values, meaning that that key can occur many different times. Um, at this point, you know, those keys are distributed across many machines, so there's no guaranteed uniqueness at all. Um, it's still immutable. It's unsorted. Um, and, but once you have that P table, you can start doing things like join operations or co-groups or group by keys that you know, will help let you aggregate the data in various ways. Um, but I need a p-table, and I didn't, all I had was a p-collection. So if we go back to my dofn, um, the variation I have to do is instead of, I, instead of returning just a reference data object, I return a pair of a common key and the reference data. Um, I can now change my function in the p-collection that gets turned returned um, to now have a p-table of string and reference data. Um, I had to change around the p-type that the function's returning a little bit, so it's a table of instead of just the Avro record. Um, but you know, with some simple changes, I'm off and running um, and ready to start doing the next type of join operation. In the join operation, the code is very complicated. Um, so here's the two P collections that I'm starting with, um, or the P tables that I'm starting with hoping to join. And I have to write that much code to join, which is a lot nicer than having to Google and find the right implementation and then hoping that there's no bugs in their implementation. And so this essentially, by default, performs an inner join. Um, and from that, I get back a p table that is strings of the data and the reference data joined together. And so now I could start, you know, sending this through another function to kind of aggregate them to back together to form better models, or to know what I was even op uh, know what I was even operating on. Um, as far as joins, there's a lot of different um, implementations already available. The normal standard ones of right, inner, left, outer. Um, you know, if it eliminates the custom implementations, which is very nice, so you don't have to worry about that sprawl inside of your company. There's a few special ones for kind of MapReduce. Um, there's the map side join, which um, I'll hint, talk about a little bit later, but there's also ones like Bloom Filter if you have different size datas and you want to, um, or you have a data set that's very small and you want to avoid some join operations and then even shard it if you wanted. Um, and there's great documentation on the Crunch website that tells you more about each one. But so I now have the join working. Um, the next box is kind of boring, because essentially it's just another dofn. So we're going to skip over that, because you essentially know what a dofn is. Um, now my next step would be to filter out the data. And as I hinted earlier, there's a filter function. Um, it's, you extend filter fn instead of dofn. You describe the type of data in. Um, but instead of having to implement a process method with an emitter, you basically get the value in and you return a Boolean to decide whether or not to include it going forward. So this is a trivial example where I say, if the value is greater than three, then include it. Otherwise, drop it out of my P collection. Um, and so to apply it, I simply say, take these values, filter them with my function. Um, and you'll notice that the P tables don't change because I'm not actually manipulating their data types. <clears throat> so now the next step would be to actually you know, I want to aggregate and group this data together. So at this point, I have, across many different machines, 
various, infl- various versions of the model and key together, um, and probably I have the key at this point to be like a person's ID, because the goal is to be able to give you a complete person record at the very end. Um, so I've now grouped them, um, or I have all of various P tables, or a P table with um, the key as being the person's ID, various model objects to kind of build them up, and now I need to group them all together. Because at this point, no machine has a complete picture of what this person's data looks like. Um, so I have this P table of string and model, and I do what's called the group by key operation. And this gives me back a P group table, and it's kind of the third variation on a P collection. Um, this one is basically a P collection of a pair of key to an iterable of values. Um, so this will make sure that for all values with the same key, they are going to be sent to the same machine, and I'll be able to iterate through them to be able to build out that person's complete record. Um, it's an iterable, because we're talking about big data, and you don't want to have something like a normal Java collection where it has to hold all of those variables in memory for you, because you'll quickly blow your heap. Um, so instead, the goal would be I'd iterate over them, process them, decide how to include them, and things like that before making a decision not try to hold them all into my memory. Um, it's immutable, and the key difference also is that it's sorted as opposed to unsorted, like the P table. So I've now grouped it by key. Um, I send it through one more dofn to actually create the person record, and now I'm ready to actually persist this out for the next stage of processing. And I'm going to pers- persist it as an Avro file. Um, so I have a P collection of person is what they got out of that last function. <clears throat> and now I say pipeline.write of that person to an Avro file. Um, an Avro file target is the actual explicit under behind the scenes. Um, and so this is the introduction of what's the concept called a target. And so a target basically is um, you have to have at least one to basically terminate your directed acyclic graph. Um, and that's where kind of all of your persistence should be. Some people kind of um, try to cheat the system on their initial implementations. They say, oh, I'll have a dofn and it'll have a side effect of writing out to this third party system. Um, one, that's kind of a bad thing to do because you can easily denial of service attack things in MapReduce jobs. Um, but two, it's bad because the pipeline implementations actually require you to have at least one target because if it doesn't have a target, it's smart enough to say, you don't want to write anything, so I don't have to run anything. Um, it's kind of a thing that's bit a few people because they're like, huh, I'm telling it to run, but nothing's happening and it's because they never told us to persist anything. Um, and the similar to the source, for everything you could read in, you could write it back out in various implementations, and you can write your own custom ones if you wanted to send it into a different system. So this is kind of what the diagram started with. We've now completed it. And if we look back, the nice thing is we haven't had to change the diagram. We haven't tried to squeeze anything in. We haven't tried to shift or manipulate anything. All we've done is taken that diagram that probably an architect wrote on a whiteboard at the very beginning of the process and substituted out those boxes with a function or with a join operation or a source or a target. And you know, you can now almost show this to an executive and they would understand what you just built. Um, apologies to the executives in the room. Um, so it, it makes understanding this thing a lot easier. Um, you don't have to worry about it, people breaking it as much. So the one thing is uh, everything's lazily executed. So nothing's actually happened out of all of those different um, processing steps. Um, All we've done is said, read the data here, process it, write it out. Um, We actually have to have do a pipeline.done to actually say, do something. And when that happens, it takes your job, it figures out how to split it up efficiently, branch it off into one or many MapReduce jobs if you're using that pipeline, um, ship the jars off to the cluster, break it all out, and start trying to execute them in order. And so you don't, at this point, if you are new or naive to MapReduce, you don't know how many jobs are going to happen. Um, and that's something you, you kind of get to be blissfully unaware of. You've just focused on the processing steps. If behind the scenes, with the description of this problem, how we wrote it right now, this is actually how it would get composed. You know, it would take, in a single map, uh, the map side of a MapReduce, it would read in the data, process them, send them off to a reduce to do the join operation, <coughs> apply the next two functions, and then do another reduce because we have to group in a different way. Um, if you're experienced with map reduce, you're probably cringing looking at this diagram. Having a reduce floating out there with no map is a bad thing. 
It's not the most efficient use of technology. Um, but this is also where you now get to start figuring out how to improve the system. Um, you know, you get to start tuning it to figure out, hey, maybe my reference data is small enough I can fit it into memory. Let me change the join strategy around to be a map side join instead of just being a raw join. And then I don't have to have that first map reduce, and I can get that down to one job. Um, but, you know, at this point you have the processing thing working. You don't actually have to, you know, rewrite, fit things into um, mappers and reducers. You can just change that one bit of code that did the join and retry it again. Um, or if you're watching the job running, you can decide, hey, you know, I, can, I don't have enough reducers. I should probably scale that out. You could do things like that. Um, and so there's a few options actually in um, Crunch that'll let you do things to kind of tweak the performance. You can change grouping options, parallel options, scale factors to describe how your data is changing. Um, there's even a few cases where you can do breakpoints to say, this thing is going to be compute heavy. You might want to store it here. Um, so there's different ways you can handle that. But the key thing is when you start doing this type of development, you're focusing on the functionality first as opposed to focusing on how to fit things into a, like a square peg into a round hole. Um, you have that smaller learning curve. You're just writing functions and connecting them together. Um, you know, less fragility because everyone can ideally um, mentally comprehend what the processing model actually looks like as opposed to someone fit this all in. I'm really worried about upsetting the balance so I don't know what to do. Um, or your system is actually imbalanced and just waiting for one developer to add one function somewhere and tip it over the edge. Um, and then you get that whole idea to be able to iterate with confidence. You know, I know that if I add this one function onto the end of the processing pipeline, I'm not going to break all of the other ways that we were outputting the data or all the other paths that we were processing the data. Um, and you can build off of that pipeline to add on that new functionality. You know, I'm going to branch suddenly right here and now, you know, keep going to load it into my new system. So there's a bunch of great documentation. Um, out on the Crunch website. The user guide got built out at the very beginning of this year, um, and so it's very, very helpful. I would suggest looking at that. Um, the second link is the um, Flume Java paper that you can buy from ACM if you want to know kind of what inspired the system. Um, and then kind of some, one of the common questions people ask is, why should I use this over this? Um, cascading being the common one. Um, there's a great discussion between the creators of Crunch and the creator of Cascading on why to choose one system or the other, and there's a core discussion on that if you're interested. Um, so with that, I just thank you for your time, and hope everyone has some fun playing with big data. <laughs>